Hi there, it's Howie in the UK. I'm pleased to be back uh, with the first video production in quite a while uh, and sticking to my generally favorite subject, which is the mathematical foundations of biology. I'm going to be talking to you about an introduction to cellular automata. This is one of the most interesting areas of biological mathematics and really helps us understand the nature of life. Life has always been seen as an absolutely miraculous process, uh, triggered by some uh, elan vital uh, which animates all living creatures and gives them a spark of life. Uh, the first concepts that life actually could be somewhat mecha uh, mechanistic in nature uh, came from Descartes during the Enlightenment, but it really wasn't until the time of Darwin that biological processes as uh, the mechanical drivers of life came into a full appreciation with the scientific community. Uh, it hasn't been really until about 1950 uh, that we've been able to think about life in a more mathematical form, reducing the nature of life and the problems of living uh, to a mathematically stud studyable kind of uh, process. And this was done by the great mathematician John von Neumann. Uh, it places life on a platform not specific to organic chemistry itself, which imposes uh, its own behaviors upon life. And it allows us to understand life processes uh, and what there must be in those processes to make them work in a general sense. And it even perhaps will allow us to make new life forms which we're already beginning to do now. Let's talk about the problems of life. The primary question that comes to mind is how can any system break the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially says things become more disordered over time? Well, in an open system, which our planet, say, is, uh, energy is coming into the system, and energy can be harnessed to actually become more complex, as well as to become more disorganized. So it's just which way you want to use the energy. The second problem is quite a bit more interesting. How can any entity uh, contain information that actually describes itself? If you can imagine uh, if you're using information to say how to build something, that you also have to contain the information to say how that building is going to be done, but then you need more information to contain that information and more information to contain the information about the information. So it's a self-referencing problem and seems, uh, on first thought, to be insolvable. Then there's just the mechanical questions of how something can actually build itself, and that's non-trivial. And finally, given that you can actually get something copying itself, replicating, how do you have information structures employed that allow holding the increased complexity and the coding of the increased complexity and the new facilities that that increased complexity implements? Many definitions of life are metabolic in nature. That is, they deal with how life harnesses energy to process the materials that allow its functioning. But by that sort of definition, you could say that a, a fire actually is alive. Building with heredity means that something new can be spawned that in its own right has the ability to continue to replicate with heredity. And if we go even further with evolvable life, which is life as we know it, uh, the encoding form that exists in describing the replicating entities has a scope that allows a very vast range of additional life forms that themselves evolve with heredity to be spawned. So that's what gives the richness and uh, selection range of life that is so vital for Darwinian evolution. So let's see now what uh, von Neumann envisaged in his uh, universal constructor, his machine that could build a copy of itself. And his first idea was something that was essentially mechanical in nature. It was an, an assembly machine, which he called the kinematic machine, and it used 
available parts that were fixed in number but had particular properties. Parts that were logical, parts that were mechanically structured, and parts that were sensory. And it used a construction arm that would be controlled and would maneuver these uh, primitive parts into a replica image of itself. Let's have a look inside von Neumann's kinematic machine. To actually build a replicated unit, uh, we have a controller element which is managing a construction arm, the constructor itself. And the constructor picks up the components, the primitive components, moves them over into the uh, replicated unit that's being built, and puts them in the appropriate place. All of this has got to be done to a plan, and that plan is contained in a blueprint instruction unit, essentially a program storage. So program storage runs controller, runs constructor, builds the physical element of the machine. But of course the machine isn't replicated until it has the program, a duplicate program, of the blueprint instructions contained within it. And so a second phase is required, which is a blueprint copier. And by having this blueprint copier, uh, we basically solve the problem of self-referencing. So what did von Neumann find in this kinematic model? He found that to save the system from uh, degenerating, and also to solve the problem of uh, self-referencing, uh, he needed to make a machine that reproduced itself in two phases. First, one that would read and execute the program as instructions to the constructor unit to produce the offspring. So this is a, a translation process for the blueprint. Second thing uh, that was required is to read the program only as data, not as something to be executed. And to duplicate that data in a new tape in the offspring. And this is the process of transcription. Translation and transcription are the key processes that were later discovered in DNA. Von Neumann wasn't actually particularly happy with this model of a kinematic machine, this intelligent crane that could be proved to be actually a, a fundamentally simple computer, a Turing machine because the components themselves that built it up were fairly sophisticated logic units and it was a very difficult thing to actually deal with this model uh, in, a, in a rigorous mathematical fashion. Uh, one of his co-workers, a fellow called Stan Ullman, a mathematician, uh, made a suggestion to von Neumann that he treat the system as uh, what's known as finite state automata. Uh, essentially make the entire ki kinematic structure from small, exactly similar automata. And each of those automata would be a machine that had a finite number of particular states and that, that uh, those states uh, executed in different fashions in different places essentially would carry out all of the function of the kinematic machine. It actually turned out to be a 29 state machine that von Neumann first came up with. And he implemented this structure on a two-dimensional infinite grid of spaces. Von Neumann's model has two real problems. First, it's very complex. You might even say irreducibly complex. It's also error-prone. Langton showed in 1984 that the use of a Turing machine structure was really beyond the requirements of the problem itself. Uh, Langton developed some very simple replicating automata uh, that met the criteria of replication, even replication with limited evolvability. More recent developments in cellular automata are ones that model primitive chemical behaviors uh, between the automata themselves. These automata also move and don't require fixed positions in a grid. And these are the closest that mathematicians have come to representing the complexity of behavior of uh, life itself, including life's evolvability.